You have been told a comfortable lie. It is written in every textbook since 1965. It says that 13.8 billion years ago, time began. Before that moment, there was nothing. No space, no geometry, no history. But there is a flaw in this story. It violates the second law of thermodynamics. This law states that the total disorder, entropy, of an isolated system always increases over time. Heat flows from hot to cold, and processes are irreversible. If you rewind the clock to the Big Bang, you find something impossible. The early universe wasn't chaotic. It was perfectly smooth. It was uniform. It had suspiciously low entropy. It was too perfect. Sir Roger Penrose calls this the whale curvature hypothesis. For the Big Bang to happen the way we see it, the geometry of the universe had to be fine-tuned to an accuracy of 1 in 10 to the power of 123. That is a mathematical impossibility. Unless the Big Bang wasn't the beginning. Unless the order didn't come from nowhere. Unless it was inherited. It seemed to me a really good idea to have the condition on the Big Bang that you could continue it in the same way. I should say the idea of doing this was a former student of mine, Paul Todd, who was a colleague of mine, and he used this as continue, conformal continuation as a, as a nice way of saying what the condition is on the Big Bang to give you what you want. But that's a huge condition. But it, nevertheless, it's what starts our universe off in, in a, a, a very special state, which is what we live off in a way. It's the second law of thermodynamics needs that to, to get going. Penrose proposes a new model, conformal cyclic cosmology. He suggests the universe is not a line, but a chain. He calls each cycle an eon. Our Big Bang was simply the death of the previous eon. But how does a dead, cold universe turn into a hot Big Bang? The answer lies in mass. Mass is the clock of the universe. It defines time and distance. Without mass, you cannot measure time. Eventually, all matter will decay. Black holes will evaporate. The universe will contain nothing but photons. And here is the trick. Photons have no mass. They do not experience time. To a photon, eternity happens in an instant. Without mass, scale loses its meaning. A universe the size of a trillion light years and a universe the size of an atom become mathematically identical. The infinite cold of the future is conformally rescaled into the infinite heat of the Big Bang. It is the ultimate recycling program. The heat death of the old gods becomes the fire of the new creation. But Penrose realized something terrifying. If this is true, the old universe might have left scars. So this describes what's called the event horizon. Somebody, an external observer looking in, will never the light that escapes also cannot have ever been inside this horizon. The other feature about this picture, which is important, is the singularity in the middle. This is a place where space-time curvatures have become infinite, where densities have become infinite. This poor collapsing star here is squashed to an infinite density. Whether that makes any sense, well, we'll think about a bit. But the, in the mathematical picture of this collapse, you have in the middle a singularity. In the final days of the previous eon, the only things left were supermassive black holes. Monsters billions of times the mass of our sun, drifting in the dark. But even they are not eternal. As Stephen Hawking proved, black holes leak. They emit Hawking radiation. Over quadrillions of years, they slowly evaporate into pure energy. When they finally die, they release their entire mass energy in a final, violent burst this is the last scream of a dying universe. This energy doesn't disappear. It hits the crossover surface, the boundary between their universe and ours. It punches through the veil of the Big Bang. Because of the conformal rescaling, that massive burst of energy gets compressed into a single, tiny dot in our new universe. Penrose calls them Hawking Points. They are the tombstones of dead black holes. This was just a theory until 2010. Penrose and Vahe Gurzadian decided to look for these points in the real world. They looked at the cosmic microwave background, the baby picture of our universe. 
They weren't just looking for dots. They were looking for ripples. If a black hole collision happened in the previous aeon, it would send gravitational waves crashing through the Big Bang, creating concentric rings, like rain on a pond. They found them. In the WMAP and Planck satellite data, they identified regions with significantly lower variance than the standard model allows. Rings, perfectly centered. The scientific community panicked. They claimed it was noise. They said it was a statistical fluke. But Penrose held his ground. He said the rings are too precise. They are signals. If these rings are real, they are the first direct observational evidence of a time before time. They are physical proof that we are living in a recycled cosmos. Think of a, a pond and it rains on the pond. Every time a drop of water hits the pond, a ripple comes out. Now that's like these black holes colliding and a ripple mm -hmm. goes out of disturbance and gravitational waves. So you get these ripples. After a while, the rain stops. That's when the black holes will disappear pop, you see. Mm -hmm. After a while, the rain stops, but you still see the ripples all me messy. It looks like a, just a mess, you see. But in principle, you should be able to work out that these ripples are made up out of individual places where the raindrops have hit. In the same way, I'd say, you can look at this background radiation, and there's now a lot of information from these new satellites and so on, which have been observing the very detailed structure of this background radiation. Um, you should be able to analyze it and see whether it's made up out of these individual events which are spread out in this way. There is one final question. If energy survives the crossover, does information survive? If a civilization in the previous eon encoded a message into a black hole, could we read it? We might be Eon 5 or Eon 100. We have no way of knowing how many times this has happened. We are trapped in an eternal loop of birth and death. Are we the first? Or are we just the latest? I find it absolutely fascinating that it's even possible to consider what happened before the Big Bang. So well, it's not, it's so, not so outrageous. OK, it is outrageous, but not so outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's conceivable that, that this, would, this would work, yeah. And it does explain the very special nature of the Big Bang, the, because the whole thing doesn't work without that. So that's, that's I think, one positive feature that, that other theories don't seem to, to give us.